I want to introduce you two speakers and one moderator. So I'll start from the moderator, Natasha Baker. She's our curator of the, one of our curators of the fair. She has co-curated the section Tomorrow's Today. Wonderful success, thank you. And the two artists, Binta Diao and Francesco Iodice. Uh, just to give you a bit of insight, very short on them. Binta Diao is a very young star. <laughs> you are a star. <laughs> She's an um, Italian Senegalese artist uh, who lives and works between Europe and Africa. Um, some of her works and installation is at the fair with Prometheo Gallery. She works on installation of different dimensions, and the plastic research is part of a philosophical reflection on the social phenomena that define our contemporary world, such as migration, the notion of belonging, and the question on black uh, female bodies. Francesco Iodice uh, is a very well-known Italian artist, photographer, professor, architect, a lot of things <laughs> um, from Milan. Uh, his, his researches encompass changes in modern social landscape, underlining new relevant phenomena in urban anthropology. His work explores the urgency for a common ground between art and geopolitics. I leave you the floor and enjoy the talk. Thank you so much for having us, and thank you all for uh, coming to the talk on a Saturday afternoon, almost evening at 5 p.m. after what I'm sure has been a long afternoon at the at the art fair. Um, it's my real pleasure to be sharing this uh, platform today with Binta and Francesco, um, and I, I think where I would like to start. We'll have some images in the background of their work um, on a loop, their individual practices, and um, you could maybe try to guess whose is whose since there's no title, but some of you may have seen their work at the Cape Town Art Fair as well. And that's really where I want to start. Um, if you could tell us about your work at the fair, um, which is what brings you to Cape Town, and your, uh, you know, your galleries are, are both presenting your work here. And I thought that could perhaps be a good place to start. Um, some people might have seen it, some people may not, may not have seen it. Um, but uh, I think since we are here and um, we've just been going back and forth to the fair, um, could you share a little bit about what people would have seen there or what they can expect to see? And then we can maybe begin to um, work our way backwards to unraveling uh, your practice and you know uh, your different projects. Does that sound good? Hello to everyone. Uh, it is working. Okay. Okay. Hello to everyone. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank um, uh, the fair. Um, all the people involved and uh, all the people uh, uh, that uh, support me in, uh, in my travel and uh, in everything, and also my gallery. Um, so um, I'm represented by Prometeo Gallery, which is in uh, Milan. And uh, for the fair, we, uh, we are showing actually a body of work um, that I show in an exhibition, actually my first solo show with that gallery that happened in September. Um, all these works come from um, uh, a project actually called La Plage Noire. Uh, I've been reading uh, a lot some uh, Edouard Glisson writings and um, I've been fascinated by one of them in particular, um, La Poétique de la Relation, um, a very intense and complex text uh, that tries to, uh, I mean, open conversation and uh, um, imagination about uh, bodies, uh, territories, um, geographies, 
um, in a post-colonial, actually, context. Um, so yeah, Glissant was the, the starting point of the whole um, body of work. I am um, presenting uh, um, some installation. Um, the starting point of this installation is the mangrove. So the plant, uh, this plant actually, um, which is based actually from different other plants. So it's like a, a, um, a body of, uh, of different plants, no? Um, so there's also this um, notion of plural and singular, which is very interesting for me. Um, I'm very fascinated also by this plant, not only because of uh, its importance actually uh, for us, for all of us as human beings, because mangroves produce oxygen, but um, I'm fascinated also um, on uh, their physicality, actually. They are eradicated in the soil, so there's this deep connection with the soil. At the same time, there's this connection with the water, salty water, and then they're like in contact with the air and the sky. So this multiple, actually, um, state of being, uh, for me, it's very interesting. And at the same time, I try to uh, make um, relation also to how the black body um, are, is always trying to find strategies to uh, survive. At the same time, the mangroves were also uh, seen for the, um, by the enslaved people as a place actually to, to find strategies to uh, escape from the plantations. So I found that anecdote also very interesting. That's why I, and I think that this helped me ac actually to experiment uh, on these uh, shapes and uh, on these, uh, yeah, on these shapes. I choose hair as a, as a material to, to uh, to express myself. So as you can see also in that image, um, I used to use hair as a tool to, to reclaim um, my identity, a tool to reclaim also my ancestors and all the stories uh, behind me about uh, the African continent. Um, so I think it's, uh, for me, hair are super important, and uh, and and I also use actually I use them as a tool to to express myself. Um, at the same time, I I conceive hair not only as a, an element but also as a, a living entity. No, so hair are attached to our heads, and uh, even if they're like external, no. Uh, they are completely part of our bodies. So, yes, I'm showing this, and at the same time, uh, I'm showing some pictures that are coming from um, a long series of photographies called Paisage Corporel, in which I'm trying to explore um, how black women, I mean, yes, how black women uh, are always in movement, no? Uh, with nature and how nature is inside our bodies. So it's like a sort of eco-feminist reflection, um, but at the same time, um, through the drawings that I used to do on the surface of this picture, because the pictures are part of my body, I'm trying also to, uh, um, to show how uh, the black body is always like a site of, um, oppression and um, signs of racism. Racism, actually. Yeah. And also the landscape. Because yes, of course. They, of course. Um, look very much like landscapes. Yes. I can see the impact of Edward Glissant on your work as well because. In his, he was a, a philosopher and a, an intellectual from Martinique in the Caribbean and exploring this relationship between the Caribbean and France and um, this idea of um, the poetics of relation to 
uh, conceive of the world really like an archipelago where you know diff we are these islands always shifting, always changing and in motion because both the hair and the plant and the photography, the woman's body form like this uh, archipelago as well of relations to each other. Um, and I, I think they very symbolic, highly symbolic language of all these materials um, and also having all these hybrid qualities as well. Each, each one has all these hybrid qualities, many things that you can read into it. And, um, and, and I think that probably also expresses your experience of being Senegalese and Italian and also moving between um, these two continents. Um, so it's, it's, um, this is also um, one of Binta's installations that we see here in the slide. And so I think you'll recognize um, her work when you see it in the fair and how these three things are in dialogue with each other and this idea of hybridity. So at the core also of, um, you know, of, of both the plants, but I think also of the material and also of the experience um, of the body. Um, Francesco, can you tell us um, about uh, your work in the Cape Town Art Fair? Yes, of course. Um, maybe we can scroll a little bit the images. Uh, first of all, uh, as Pinta, I would like to thank the Italian consulate for supporting us, the fair, and I'm so very glad. It's my first time in South Africa, so I'm very excited. Everything is very new and interesting for me. Um, uh, maybe we can scroll to the very end of my images, uh, like one more. Yeah, this one is okay, one, one or the other, because this is one of the works which is here in, 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 the, uh, in the fair. And by the way, I would also would like to thank my, the gallery which, which is presenting me here, which is Galleria Michele Rizzo from Venice. And uh, Maybe this is a good work to try to explain what, I, what I'm focusing my research in the last years. Probably since 2008, I have had like a sort of obsession for the decline of the Western culture. Probably since the event of the collapse of the financial system, the collapse of the Bern Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Uh, as a European, I decided I wanted to investigate the reasons of the decline, if it was like a final stage of our history, and if history was starting to normally move somewhere else. So uh, I actually have been uh, quite busy in the last years uh, uh, making a lot of research and projects uh, in, in the art fair, you can also see a, a film that I did for the Venice Biennial a few years ago, which is called Atlas, Atlante, which is mainly made of archival footage, and it's once again about the uh, reasons of the decline of the Western culture. The work you see here, which is a photographic diptych, it, I want to start from this one because it's a very recent work. Uh, it's like six, six months old, and um, it looks like a very happy image. But actually, uh, for me, it's a sort of a ritual. It's, of course, a fake image, which is totally uh, built. Actually, it's been drawn and then, and then realized. And the reason behind this image, it, this image starts from a writing that I was um, very, uh, it's a writing from a um, uh, British um, historian called Rainer Banham, which many years ago in a book told that for him the surfers in California looked like the continuation of the tradition of the pioneers, of the pilgrim fathers, of the gold prospectors during the gold rush and whatever. And he used to say that the West the, uh, was like a, a symbolic uh, synopsis of the concept of the Western culture. And then for him, the surfers were like, he, he said that the people who arrived in California in the late 18th century, uh, they were going through such a long trip that in a way, the trip itself, the journey itself was becoming the real goal. And that for, for him, the surfers were, had this uh, 
uh, were like representing this concept of keeping going west. So I want to do something about this. I, I, I just wanted to uh, work on the concept of keeping going west, like the only desperate chance to save whatever could be saved of the Western cultures, uh, their, the responsibilities of the Western cultures, uh, the failures of the Western cultures. So what I did, I, I took this picture, uh, the picture of the sea in a low tide moment, which is a non-surfing non sea, of course. It's a sort of dead sea, so it looks more like a blurred lake. And, and then I uh, have uh, very slowly inserted all these surfers that don't act like surfers. They're not waiting for ripples. They're just like in a, uh, in a, in a sort of liturgical uh, situation, just pointing at the very center of this diptych towards the Pacific Ocean, to, towards the horizon, towards the sunset. And uh, so on one side, there's this idea that, that it might still be a never-ending journey. On the other side, it's conceptually, I wanted to uh, transform this image in a very sort of static condition, not, not, which is quite the opposite of what should happen in the surfing culture. Nothing is moving, nothing is happening anymore. Everybody stands still waiting for something to happen, which might not happen at any time. And um, um, can we slide to the next one? Maybe there's another one, yeah, which is also one of the pictures which is shown in, in, in the fair. And it's the, these two images are taken from the same project, which is called West, by the way. And, um, and once again, it's an investigation of uh, how the construction of the image of the Western culture, culture was, uh, was imagined, built, proposed, and um, assumed by all, by, by all of us. This is a very famous place. Probably a few of us uh, of you might have been there. It's, it's one quite famous uh, um, uh, part of the Monument Valley. And the place where this picture is taken is called the John Ford Point, because it's the point where the filmmaker John Ford used to film. And the guy in the picture, who's a Native American, says to be the grandnephew uh, of the Navajo uh, man who used to play for John Ford in that place. Uh, whether this is true or not, I don't know. But, um, and I'm standing in a place, everybody could take this picture, anybody. But when I, when I, when I took the picture, there's, there's a jar with just one writing over it saying, one picture, one dollar. So he's, he is actually, he's a Native American who's playing the role of the Indian of a Western movie from maybe the 30s, the 40s, Stagecoach or whatever other movie from the great filmmaker John Ford. But what I was trying to say with this picture is that, is, is this landscape real or unreal? Where is the blurred border in between fiction and reality? whether we're talking about this place or the construction of the Western imagery, imaginary nowadays everywhere. Um, I always also work very much on the texture of my work as a photographer, as a filmmaker. Uh, they tend to look like paintings, even if they are not. They're just simple films or photographs because I always try to work on the spectator. I'm obsessed about working on the point of view of the spectator. How can I alienate the spectator? How can I turn suspicious the spectator? I always think that the best thing could happen to somebody looking at my works is asking themselves, uh, what am I looking at? Should, should I believe this or should I investigate more? Most of my th works are totally un un ununderstandable. There is, there are just, they're made of very few signs and I'm always trying to build models and process of participations with the public. There's nothing, almost nothing said. They always look like beautiful things, very aesthetical. Even they are quite political. And one part of the politics is really involving, eventually, the spectator in asking, what are the missing information in these works? Uh, how could I complete the narration which is totally missing or totally faking in some of these works? 
So when I saw the series um, of California, which is actually quite so interesting because California as a place, Los Angeles as a place is um, in, in a way uh, very much photographed. You know, um, there's, it's, it's one of those places that even if you've never been there, you know what it looks like because you've either seen in films or ph photography and, you know, there's um, uh, that have sort of defined this landscape. And, and, and so I was curious first, what took you to California as the West uh, coming from Europe? Um, you know, why that was the point of the West for you? Um, whereas maybe from Africa, I would include Europe from if I was looking up from South Africa, I would include Europe as part of the West, you know? So I'm, I'm curious about your perspective that, that took you there. And then there was an interesting quote that I saw in relation to the series because uh, in, in the portfolio of the works, there was some interesting text and quotes as well. And there was a quote about um, that, I, that I actually thought was so true because it said something about how Los Angeles is, you know, uh, um, the image of Los Angeles, the idea of Los Angeles is sold as Los Angeles, you know? Um, and I thought that was so powerful because there is this commodification of the image in a way, you know, and that um, people do buy into images of places too. And I, I don't remember the exact quote, but I, th I thought it sort of, you know, hit the nail on the head. Um, and of course, I'm glad you mentioned the Native American and the Navajo Nation in, in the West because much of the West is photographed as empty when in fact we know, you know that the West was not empty. Uh, like in, in other examples too, there were uh, many indigenous groups throughout um, North America. And when you go further west into the Pacific, you hit Hawaii, you hit Tahiti, you hit you know the the Pacific, which is a continent in and of itself, given the all the islands that make up the Pacific, and um, and that's a whole nother story, of course. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to leave it there because you know that's already very many questions. <laughs> um, first of all, when I started this project, actually in in the last. Since 2008, I have done three films and one photographic project on this obsession. I think all artists, we don't work, we work on obsessions. It's, we try to, to, to find a solution to sleep at night. It's, that's what I think we do sometimes. And um, this project specifically, which is called West, at first I wanted to do it about, uh, I wanted to work on the, on the ruins of the Roman Empire. Then I changed my idea and I wanted to work on the collapse of Wall Street. And then I decided to go to the American West and work. The main idea was to work on the gold rush. Because to me, the gold rush was the first time in human history where there was a worldwide diaspora from any place in the world just to get in one point and hope for an immediate and, 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 and unreasonable kind of uh, richness. And that was like an obsession. They said, this is a good metaphor of what I think is one of the failures of our uh, cultural system. So that, that was my obsession. California was just the arrival point because actually I have been working in, in 12 st states of the west of the United States where the gold rush happened, even, not of, even in Mexico and in Klondike from Louisiana until California. So I've been spending quite a lot of time uh, through three journeys, uh, four journeys actually, since 2014. Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles is, is a place where we have all been so many times. We almost go every, every day in Los Angeles. Any, anytime we open a TV drama, TV series, movie, half of our uh, fictional imaginary is made in Los Angeles. And that's why Los Angeles has no identity. There is no, there is no Colosseum or Tour Eiffel. There is no monument. The only monument is a, is a riding made, made with cardboard. So it's, yeah, there, there's nothing. And, and so it's neutral. It can be whatever, you, it's a mirage. It can be whatever you want. And so that's why I was a bit obsessed with Los Angeles because it's what uh, the Western, uh, society and culture has been trying to sell everywhere in the world. 
we are everything, we can be, we are everywhere. Uh, we look like nothing because you can make a projection of your own desires on this, uh, on, on this landscape. And, um, uh, yeah, I don't know if I yep. answered. Maybe. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I think you answered it. And I think you also answered the question of, you know, that um, this sort of fa that that this is a failure that you're investigating and less less of a triumph, um, and it brings me back to um, I think something that you've mentioned, but to the sort of next question that I think um, you can both speak to is uh, the question of you know where the impulse or the idea or the investigation how that begins, and I know both your practices is very rooted in a. A, a, a research methodology, and uh, you often work collaboratively. You part of multiplicity collaborative, and there's a deep investigation into, you know, um, um, the intersection of architecture, or social systems, or histories, and and the outcome is often one where it's no longer possible to understand a moment, a history, a person, an event. In, in one way, um, and so I th I was you know wondering if you could speak a little bit more to your individual research methodologies and practices because that's probably almost as intense as the creation of the work itself. Yes, so um, maybe to follow what you said, um, for me uh, art is not an obsession but um, a necessity. So, um, yeah, I see my practice as a way to express myself and uh, to, to find the place, actually, where I am. Um, I was born and grew up in, uh, and I grew up in Italy uh, from Senegalese parents. And uh, I think that the moment when I uh, start to uh, have, actually, difficulties to identify myself um, was the, the, the beginning of my whole practice. So uh, I've been in between. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, it was very weird because I was in Italy, but at the same time, um, I grew up in there. I speak Italian as an Italian, but I was considered as an African. At the same time, in Africa, I was considered as, a, as an Italian. So that moment was very crucial for my practice because I started actually to use uh, my practice as a tool to reclaim my identity, my space. Um, and yes, so I wanted to, to, to say this. Um, I'm, my, my departure, actually my starting point is always, has always been um, history. So I've always uh, been interested in uh, deconstruct actually who told, uh, who actually was uh, narrating and who actually had the power to um, narrate our people, other peoples, or who had the power to actually um, talk about other people, no? So actually, I was interested in uh, deconstruct all these roles. So um, to deconstruct actually the Western actually um, setting um, in the past and in the contemporary era as well. So um, I try actually to do that through the body. So I always started from my personal experience to in some way um, put in a, how can I say that, um, in discussion actually, uh, all the colonial uh, past. And uh, because I think that's, I mean, uh, we as human actually are the, and also plants and whatever as well, are the, um, actually the, um, how can I say that, um, the best actually um, 
beings to retrace history, no? So um, through the body, actually, we can explore um, different, actually, um, different um, fields. And um, so, yeah, the body is my starting point. I am uh, I'm very interested also in, uh, in the space. So, for example, my main, actually, language is culture, installation, because for me, it's important also to engage the people, the public, in experiencing the work physically, uh, bodily. Um, I keep attention to material, so for me, uh, to symbolic material, material with different symbolic. Um, so here, for example, in this picture, you can see an installation that I made for um, a solo show last year at Cecil Fakuri in Dakar. Um, and it was a challenge for me, for the whole gallery, because um, it was an exhibition about um, how, about an historical event that happened in, uh, in Senegal, and um, in the past, of course, and about uh, the contemporary society in Senegal. So. This work, for example, uh, was trying to retrace uh, the story of some um, Senegalese and uh, West African soldier called uh, Trailleurs Senegalais, who were actually part of the French army. Uh, so returning back to uh, their land, actually in Senegal, in Dakar, uh, they have been killed by the French because they refused to pay them as they uh, they decided actually at the beginning. So um, yeah, I mean they start to in some way um, um, yeah they start actually a pacific manifestation, and uh, but at the end of the day the French reacted reacted in that way, you know, with violence. So through this work actually I try to represent a field an agricultural field. Because a lot of them were farmers exactly. also before they became soldiers. Exactly, before of them there uh, were farmers. And at the same time, I was interested in uh, um, putting highlight the soil as uh, uh, a living entity that in some way is part of all of us. So for me, it was interesting to um, create this field, uh, to honor actually, um, their life, their presence. Um, but at the same time, the idea was to, in some way, try to give to the public the possibility to find themselves in that context and to ask themselves, actually, um, questions, actually, to question in themselves about what happened, actually. You know? I don't know if it's clear. Um, at the same time, I think that soil it's um, it's very it's a very important element uh, in art because um, there's also a notion of care that return every time when you work on this kind of installation. I mean, uh, you need to take care of it. It's something that it's living. It's uh, it's not just an object. Um, that's why I cannot define my works as objects. Um, and also, at the same time, it needs the involvement of, uh, of other people. Uh, yeah, and this happened actually, the involvement of other people happened in the, um, when I conceived another artwork called uh, Diaspora, uh, the one that we were seeing before. Not this one, the one with the braids. Braids. Uh, now the other way. Other way. Yeah. No. This one. This one. Yes. This work. Um, I I work on this uh, installation with uh, three women, um, because it's like a war. Like they're a hairdresser. And um, this work is like a reflection on uh, um, the terms of diaspora 
um, the title itself, it's diaspora, but it's written actually in uh, Latin. Um, the meaning of the diaspora is dispersion. So basically the reflection was about how uh, seeds actually, um, the dispersion of seeds created actually di the notion of diaspora. So I was reflecting on how African women from West Africa and um, travel actually, um, travel to, to the America actually, uh, with um, seeds actually braided in their hair. So I found this actually act uh, very poetic and very political also. Um, I found it very human because they were using these seeds also to survive during the, the trip, but at the same time to uh, let survive their culture and their also uh, knowledge. Um, and yeah, I conceived this installation with other, with uh, with some other women because for me it was important to create also this collective dimension, um, in order to create a space through the installation. So basically, for me, the most important part of the this work was um, being there with these women, uh, exchange with them. Uh, know more about their uh, uh, struggles, uh, share actually all these struggles, and um, yeah, exchange about also ans our ancestors, actually, our female ancestors. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Francesca, do you want to talk a little bit about your research and your collaboration? Yeah. Sure. And way of working? Um, can we? Uh, uh, yeah, this uh, no, uh, the previous yes, this one is fine. Um, yeah, my, uh, uh, I think I could easily say that research for knowledge is the very core of everything I of, of everything I would like to do. I would very happy if I could like as an artist dematerialize my work. I could uh, I would be much more interested in selling the connections in between my researches. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Rather than producing uh, physical works, which of course is not possible, but and it's something I shouldn't say in front of a director of an art fair. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is a good image to try to explain what I'm trying to say. This is um, this was a touring uh, exhibition of uh, my first retrospective. It's an installation which has been traveling a little bit in Europe, and this was in um, in Switzerland in Winterthur Photo Museum, and uh, there were like seven different projects f uh, shown in different rooms of the museum, but at the very center of the museum, in this huge room, what I did, I built this structure. I, I, I worked with a designer. It was a flexible structure. It could be readapted in any museum. So sometimes it was like a line. Sometimes it was like a snake getting in and out of, of it was 70 meters long. And, but anyway, it was either in the middle or it was like the skeleton of the installation of the works. And, all, and the works, the final works, the, the, the films, the photographs, they were like lateral things. The core of the exhibition was the research. So I, I built this uh, structure, table, whatever it is, and you could find books, uh, proof prints, uh, notes, uh, tryouts, uh, um, uh, film, uh, film archives. None of, none of the things were mine, none of them. It was just part of the research. It was just part of the, it's just a, a, a display. Of course, it was a, a synthetical and rhetorical uh, display of how I try to work. I'm, I'm very much interested in process, in methodology. I'm very scared of working on themes or issues and be superficial. So I have this very personal, intimate need to, uh, uh, I would say I spend 90% of my time as an artist reading, watching, and trying to build my own system of relations. And uh, I would say that my real work is how I build the system of relations of the informations and the knowledge I get 
from whatever I'm reading, meeting, interviewing, or whatever. So actually, the tables that you see here, they, they are, each single table is dedicated to one of the projects which were displayed in the, in the museum, but it's a little piece of the research and how I put things together, how I, uh, how I try to build my own model of, of observation. I'm, I'm, I'm a very cold kind of artist. Um, um, I try to uh, face reality as a system of, of semiotics, and I try to d decrypt, yeah, decrypt all, all, all the informations to, to bring them down to a sort of matrix. And then I try to, the second thing I try to do as an artist happens after the work is finished, is how I translate, how, how I move this semiotic to the public, to the others. So I'm very interested in whatever happens before the artworks and whatever happens later after the, the end of the work. And can we go to the next image? This is a very old image. This is an, inst an image from the installation which was shown at Documenta 11, which was curated by Nigerian curator Okui M. Wedzor. Uh, I was invited as a founding member of a group which is Multiplicity. And um, it was a huge video installation. This is just a tiny image of the installation. And the project was about the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea and mainly about the things which lay on the border and what the Mediterranean Sea had become in the late 90s. Um, my idea was, I, I, I live in Milan, but I come from the south of Italy. I come from a, from a harbor city, from Napoli. And I remember that when I was young, I used to travel with my father and we could go by boat to North Africa uh, without showing documents. You didn't need to show a passport if you were traveling on the sea because there was still the echo of this old knowledge that the Mediterranean Sea was a fluid space, not because it's made of water, because it was culturally a fluid space. So information, goods, people, cultures, could easily move, not, not because people were respectful one of the other, but simply because there was still the heritage of the idea is that the more you make the spaces uh, transpassable, you can say, it can be transpassed, more, the more you get rich, even in terms of economics, it's as simple as that. Then what I think happened suddenly is that the Mediterranean was turned into, as we called it for the documenta, a solid sea. A, 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 a very, a, a, like a concrete, a very solid space, at least for some people. The project, but what, I, what I would like to explain is this. When, I, when we started the project, the, the, the thing that make, made us think that we wanted to propose the curator this project is that because there, a few days before we made the decision, uh, a, a huge boat sank in the Mediterranean and 300 people died. But even more important than this, if there's anything more important than this, is that all the states around the border of Solid Sea were denying that this thing ever happened, even if the parents of the people who died were like saying, my son my, w was on that boat. But all the countries were agreeing that nothing ever happened. Uh, but we didn't want to talk about, it's always very dangerous at, to me in art if, if you act like a journalist, if you show the drama. Because the drama is very instant, it's very passionate, but I think you lose your focus. So we tried to work with interviews, uh, text, and, and satellite maps to explain that uh, in the last uh, 30 years, the the landscape has been uh, uh, reverted, you can say reverted, but turned upside down. Europe had become very fluid. You can travel from the south of Portugal to the north of Norway without ever showing a passport. But if you want to cross the Mediterranean and you are not a rich man on a cruise boat, there's no way. The space is solid. So what we, the final image is that we, uh, we inverted like in a negative color image 
the satellite photograph of Europe. And Europe was, was, uh, was shown in, was displayed in blue like a sea. And, and the Mediterranean became a, con a solid continent, which if you didn't, you didn't have the proper passport, which mainly is, is money, uh, you wouldn't, because of course it's not a, a racial or ethnical problem. It's mainly a problem of who deserves to come to Europe. And that's a very sensible problem in, in Italy. We have a very strange perspective on, on diasporas because we are not a, a post-colonial country, not because we don't, didn't want, because we tried with the Mussolini, but happily <laughs> uh, we were like kicked, kicked back in Italy. So we don't have a post-colonial culture, but we have, as you can see from the image, we are the very simple entrance to Europe. Nobody wants to stay in Europe when coming from anywhere, anywhere. But, but because we are a peninsula, it's, very, it's quite impossible to, 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 to check and control uh, the borders. So, uh, and, and, and so it's easy, easy, in a way it's easier to access uh, Italy and in very very and this in a very rapid way this changed the perspective of the country and it and it made the people become very racist in a very like like in one night very because we had no culture of relationship with somebody else who was not ourselves and at the same time the 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 Mediterranean was started, we started to look at, I mean, not Italians, all over Europe, we started to see the Mediterranean not like an opportunity, but as a problem. And that's what we were working. But once again, the exhibition was not showing anything about all the dramatic events that happened uh, 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 and in the Mediterranean. We were just trying to uh, build a structure of knowledges. It was a very slow kind of installation. If you would read everything, which is something that I always do in my, in my works. Sometimes I do uh, works which can bring the spectators to desperation because it would take like 16 hours to read everything, see everything and relate all the informations. I don't believe that any work of art can be completed. Everything must be incomplete. Incom incomplete. And once again, because I'm, a, I'm interested in the idea that part, the, part, the final part of an artwork must be made by the spectators, by, by the viewer. And um, well, yeah, that's it. Well, that does bring us to the role of the v viewer and the, and, and the visitor and the exhibition goer, you know, however you want, the audience, however you want to call it, which I think in both your work, it really stands out that you, you know, want to have that engagement and that the person coming to see and the work and understand the work um, is a part of the work too. And I think often we have this question of what is the role of the artist, what is the role of the artist, but we don't often ask what is the role of the audience and of the visitor and of, you know, um, uh, the museum goer or, you know, wh whoever, whoever it is. So perhaps on that note, we can open to our um, audience here. And um, we still have a few minutes for some questions for Binta or Francesco from, from anyone. Um, so do we have uh, any comments, observations to or welcomed? Am I audible? Yeah? Why did you decide to focus only on the female body? Um, because I think that um, before starting to um, give my point of view about the world, about people and uh, yeah, people around me, I I first need to know myself. I mean, I, I need to to uh, ground myself. I need to, um, yeah, try to know who I am. So, I mean, all these questions actually pushed me to, uh, um, to work, actually. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you for the question and answer. Situating yourself. Do you have a question? Is there anything that you would like to add to the discussion, maybe, or point out, or or comment on yourselves um, in relation to you know your work or any of the uh, maybe themes that we've top different topics that we've picked up that you'd like to say more about, or you know maybe there's a question that you don't get asked that you'd like to be asked. Um, uh, I think it's also an opportunity to you know um, to do that. Um, well, yes, maybe I can uh, uh, answer what you just suggested about the role of the spectator, which, is, which has been investigated so much in the last years. Um, I don't know if we can move to the previous slide. One more, one more, yeah, this one. Thank you. Um, well, uh, in, there's a project which is not here. In 2011, I was invited by the museum, Museo del Prado, the Prado Museum in Madrid. They usually invite every year a contemporary artist to work on the collection of the heritage of the wonderful collection of classical uh, historical art of the Prado Museum. I was very honored to be invited. I was totally not interested in doing that. So I made a, like a um, um, trade with, uh, with Miguel Zugazza, the director at that time. And I, I told him that I, w I, I wanted to work on the spectators of the museum. So what I did, I started a, pro a project that then I've been continuing in, var in various museums. And I've been collecting the spectators. So what, what, what I, would, I did was I, I started an archive of, archive of films of spectators. I, I did eight, I have been doing 800 films of spectators for each museum. And because I was thinking that museums do exist since the 17th century, more or less the way we have them today. And they're very old and usually boring institutions. But very rarely museums have decided, they, they collect everything from coins to feathers to textures to art, whatever. But we don't have any collection of, of, of or memory of, of the spectators, of the influence of, of the museums on the spectators. So I started to do this archive of spectators. And, and it's, now it's a very huge kind of archival. And one last thing is about this installation, which was done a few years ago in Castello di Rivoli, in Turin, in Italy. And the only thing I want to say about the installation, which was a circular installation around the spectator. So you would enter, and you had a, like an, a, a sort of square of agora, of people, of intellectuals, uh, like uh, Angela Davis, speaking. But they would appear right at your back. You would turn, and then somebody else would speak at your back. So you were always missing the point. You could, at, at the best, listen them. Uh, so one screen was turning on, then the other one at your back. So it was like a sort of gymnastic for the spectator, but you could be sure that you could not see the installation. You could, it was, I was trying to do something very frustrating for the public. So I don't think that the public should be served, it should be helped. I think you, we should put the spectator in a sort of very unbalanced kind of condition. He must make a lot of workout both intellectuals and even physical. He, he must understand that art is a struggle, and uh, because life is a struggle, because reality is, is, is complicated. My favorite title in the history of art of his exhibition is, an exhib is the retrospective of Alfredo Jar, which was titled, It is Difficult. I love it. I'm very envy of that title, <laughs> very envy. So, and, and it's, a it's, it's a very good way to explain from my point of view, the, di the dialectical landscape in between the artist and the spectator. It is difficult for both of us, because we are in the middle of a, of a biosphere, of an environment which is getting more and more complicated. And the very dangerous thing that they try to show us every day, like it's getting simpler, more and more simplified. No, not at all. Not at all. It, they, they, they try to make it look simple. It gets more and more difficult. And that's the beauty in art that everything is very difficult. It's, it, it's a huge complex and it's so exciting to work with the spectators. 
Pinta, do you want to add anything? Or <laughs> um, well, I, I do think what you said about the way in which your installations are living as well, and how people encounter them is that you know they are alive, and the material itself is. Um, not only material histories, but the material lives and breathes and bears witness. You know, I thought plants bear witness, the land bears witness, bodies bear witness to experience, to trauma, to cultural shifts and, and challenges. Um, and that it takes, I mean, where do you walk, for instance, you know? Um, how do you walk? How do you navigate that space where the, it's the braids, the network, which look like a rhizomatic, you know, roots of the plants, or whether it's a room that's completely covered in soil and, you know, which you're not able to step on. Um, but uh, what does it evoke also for you to see this mounds that, uh, you know, look like a burial grounds and to see the, 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 the cap, this disembodied, you know, um, material in that site. So I do think that it also means that the visitor has to also move their body in a certain way and um, become more aware of their own bodies within space, within time, within events uh, as well, within history, like you said, within, within one's an ancestry. Um, so on that, oh, now we have two questions. <laughs> When you make your art, and I mean you are at the art fair and you're sitting through galleries, are you selling to collectors who are individuals? Or is it to corporate collections or museums? Who is your primary target? Um, I, I think that's a great question for the galleries who represent the artists. Um, the question was around, you know, uh, who's the um, collector of your work? Who's the primary um, buyer of, of your work? Um, and is that something you think about when you're making your work? Um. Yeah, I think it's, uh, for me, it's essential. For example, I, I have some works uh, that are not commercial. So even if there's someone who's interested in, uh, in buying it, I'm, I mean, and I refuse. Because, for example, there's one work. Um, it's, um, maybe we can show it. It's uh, an installation of a slave ship, for example, and um, through my two galleries, we received some uh, uh, requests. But uh, yeah, I mean, personally, I do not, I don't want to actually put this image and this entity in a commercial context. So um, yeah. And about my collectors, um, I think that I'm young. Um, I'm represented by two galleries, but uh, at the same time, one is in the continent and in Paris, the other one is in Paris, in, uh, in Milan. Uh, so I have like uh, a large visibility. Um, so I cannot define my collector. Um, and I, do not think that I have, I, I will have like a specific type of collector because I think that when you buy art, it's because you feel something. And I mean, it's personal, so yeah. Uh, maybe I can just say that um, when I started to work with galleries, I had, um, for me, it was a bit difficult actually to see my works um, with other people, I mean, Mm, for me, it was dif difficult to actually conceive my work as like a product. And uh, yeah, so maybe I can say that I would love to expose my, my works uh, in public institutions because uh, in institutions you can have also a variety of different people and also uh, a different type, um, type of access. 
And there's still a way that an artist can make a living by showing their work in public or institutional context as well because it supports the production of the work, it supports the artist through a fee. So it doesn't always have to be that art becomes an object which is sold. There are many ways that institutions or not-for-profits or foundations work with artists to support the artist's work because um, it's 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 about the ideas, it's about the politics, about the stories, about the message as well. And I think th those things all exist together. You know, it's not one or the other. It's it's really practice based too. I think I can finally say something that will make happy the director of the fair, because w when I started, I don't think about the collectors as an individual, as you asked. I always think about the public as a whole as a confrontation in between me and the viewers. But when I was, when I was young, like Binta, many, many decades ago, um, I was very fond of making uh, residencies and grants because I thought that that would, make, that would give me freedom, freedom. Then I understood that it, it's not like that. Because when you are into a biennial, into a grant, into a, a residency, you are obliged. You have a deadline. The projects are sometimes time-specific, which I, I go crazy. Uh, the project you've seen West, it took me nine years to con No biennial in the world would wait for you for nine years. Uh, certainly not for me. <laughs> and um, they are, they are time-specific, site-specific. I hate to work on somebody else's ideas, on somebody's el I, I, unless I have a sort of very important and intense relation with the curator. So I started to understand the, the importance of the galleries and the collectors. I don't, I don't work thinking of the collectors. Usually my gallery, I have very different galleries. I have one in Spain, one in London, and two, one in south of Italy, one in north of Italy. And they ask for different kind of things, of course. Uh, I have a gallery in Azerbaijan that, of course, are totally not interested in some of my works. Uh, so what I understood in, in the end is this, that I think, in this moment, what I think is that I am like uh, an agricultural. I produce, I, I do products, like land products. I, I, I do um, pepperoni or uh, aubergine or <laughs> apples. And the gallery is the fruit vendor. And the collector that comes, for an example, to a fair has these beautiful offers of different kind of apple, any kind of apples, and he chooses whatever. It's a very Darwinian kind of uh, system. I don't know if you agree. It's like very Darwinian uh, kind of system. And of course, if you don't sell, you have to relate with that, with that problem. But I think this works perfectly. I, I like this filter in between me and the, and the collector. So the collector has the, has the freedom to choose whatever he wants. I, I have the freedom to do whatever I want. And I like very much the money coming from the collectors rather than from a biennial. Because that money buys me freedom. I was talking to Binta before the, the, op the, the beginning that in my mind, when, when the, my gallery has, has sold a few works here now in, in the fair, and I turned, in my mind, I turned the money into time, which is, of course, the most precious coin we have nowadays. So how much time I'm buying? Usually to, to be lazy and playing video games or whatever, but to buy me time as an artist. I'm not obliged to obey a biennial or whatever. So in time, my idea is, is changing. That the, the, the collectors have the right to see in my work. Usually when I, when I talk to collectors, they sometimes say totally wrong things about my works. I never correct them. It, 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 it's not my role in that, in that case. It's not my role. I, I don't think I should do that. They can project their own ideas on the works. We can. We can talk about it, but I never try to over, which I would do with a curator. If a curator would make, make a misinterpretation of my work, I can, I can run crazy. But I, would do, I wouldn't do that with a collector. So uh, I'm still very happy and very honored anytime I'm invited to a biennial or an institution, 
but I, I think of the collector as somebody who has the right to project his own ideas on my works, and he's helping me to buy freedom and time. That, that's my, my idea. And I have nothing against grants or residencies. It's, a, it's an ecosystem is how I look at the art world, that it's, it's an ecosystem, and maybe it, is a, a, maybe, maybe it is a Darwinian ecosystem, but it's nonetheless, it is an ecosystem in which you know, there are uh, uh, many things coexist and are in relation with each other and have you know, chain, chain reactions, creates chain reactions. Um, <clears throat> but I think we'll take one last question. Would, would you still like to ask a question in the back? Thank you. Um, and then we'll wrap up because I know we've gone a little bit over time. But. I was just curious to know about your um, practice and you were thinking about the, um, the public and the audience and I wonder at which point in your action of creation when, you, when the public appear because create a pieces is very different to show pieces is two different action so I just want we're wondering I just want to, to, to know I, I don't think I understood um, okay let me see if I um, heard you your question was also about the audience and at which point the artists share their work with the audience or at which point um, the audience appear in the um, in the practice of creation, when you start oh. to create something. Mm -hmm. So the other way around, at which point does the audience begin to appear in your work as you're creating it? Do they appear in your work? Do you, are you thinking about them at different points as you are creating the work? I, Did go, first I go first. <laughs> I, I know this one. <laughs> Uh, because I, I usually, when I'm working with my students, I'm very quite obsessed in, uh, about this question. When is the audience entering in the process, in the, in the process if, if, if I got it right? Um, uh, I will do something very silly. Usually when I talk with my students, I say that the process of producing an artwork could be Everybody has his own idea, but could be subdivided in four moments. Intuition, when you feel like the urgency of working on something. Then you have a second part, which is research, which in my case is, is very thick. And all these two parts have nothing to do with the audience. When I have the intuition and when I do the research, it's my own thing. It's just me and myself. Then the third and the fourth part, which is third part for me is the formal, the, the transformation into a material thing, a film, an installation, a book, a map, a photograph, and the fourth part, which is the installation. For me, installation is the process of, of a relation with, with the, the audience. So in the third and fourth moment, the formal aspect and the installation, I get totally obsessed by the audience, how the audience is going to, uh, but it's always a very tricky kind of, 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 of relation, the one I try to uh, uh, build with the audience. I always try to put the audience in a very uncomfortable kind of condition. I don't want them to understand, never, never. I don't want to understand. I just want them to ask why, what is happening around me. So for, the, for me, the... Um, 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 I did a project which was a drive-in for cars, just a drive-in. There was no work. It doesn't matter what I'm projecting. It could be a film. I could just broadcast Netflix or a porno movie. I don't care. It's the, 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 the place was a drive-in. The audience is placed into an um, environment, and they have to do the space, do the work themselves. So I don't have the audience in my mind when I think the project and when I do the research. But later, yes, the installation and even the form, formal work is a trick to place the spectator in a certain observatory. It's not about what, I'm trying them to obs what I want them to observe. It's where I put them as an observatory. That's my, what I try to do. Yeah, it's not passive. You want them to be active and you want them to be shaken up and engaged because 
our experience of the world could so easily be passive, right? But we know that it's much more complicated than that. So it's also, you know, uh, shaking them up a little bit. Um, for me, I mean, uh, it depends. Because, for example, um, when I conceived this um, piece, uh, the title of this piece is Chorus of Soil. Um, I was uh, at my last year of my master in Grenoble. I was in my atelier working alone. Um, it's a huge piece, so it's uh, eight meters. So, and I created alone. And while I was creating the piece, I was feeling actually the presences of my ancestors, of uh, of, uh, of the audience. I mean, I was feeling presences. So it depends of the, on the work. In that case, for me, the audience was actually um, an essential part of the process of conceiving uh, the piece. Um, also because, I mean, uh, when we look at this image, I mean, we're not only speaking for black people. I mean, it's about black people, but it involves also white people. So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, yeah, it's, it's uh, it, in that case, it was very, very important to um, think also about not only myself in that moment, but also about uh, other presences. In other situations, I used to have intuition, mm -hmm. uh, visions, and uh, the process. I mean, I used to work alone. Um, and then I, I face, actually, to the audience reactions. And in other cases, uh, it's, it's essential, actually, the presence of other people in the creation of the piece. Like with the... Uh, with the braids, also uh, I have also another work uh, made with uh, some women, um, some migrant women uh, in Europe, in a very complex city called Bolzano. Um, we made this uh, uh, huge textile work together. So it depends on the situation. Yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm very flexible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think that brings our conversation to an end. And I'd like to thank Laura and Charlotte for inviting us. And of course, my, I'm thankful to the artists always for their work and for their presence and for flying all the way to Cape Town to be here with us for a few short days. I, I hope you... Um, get to see the sunset and walk on the beach and do all those wonderful Cape Town things too um, and not only see the inside of the hotel and the convention center. Um, thank you so much for joining us. There's some cocktails um, following our talk. So that's the advantage of coming to a talk at 5 p.m. on a Saturday and finishing at, at 6.15. Thank you so much for your presence and your attention. Um, Laura, do you have any more words you'd like to share? Now, I really want to thank you, Francesco, Bint, and Natasha for this very inspiring conversation. And I think it's been great to have you as the last talk and thank you for being here thank you again to the italian consulate and please enjoy some food and wine outside